The following video is brought to you in part by the amazing Patreon producers you see before you. If you'd like to show your support, you can do so at patreon.com slash 616 entertainment. Your support means the world to me, and I love you so much. Now let's get to it. Two thousand and five was a roller coaster for WWE. The Matt Hardy, Lita, Edge, real life love triangle led to a truly captivating on screen storyline. Triple H and Batista had a fantastic feud over the world title. The entire premise of their rematch was built around Triple H's pedigree. The finale inside Hell in a Cell is a bloodbath classic. Speaking of bloodbath classics, it was in 2005 that the original ECW One Night Stand took place, a night that, for fans from the 90s, is unforgettable. Money in the Bank debuted in 2005. Shawn Michaels and Kurt Angle had a match at WrestleMania that not only lived up to, but exceeded expectations. You may notice that these are all positives, and that's where the aforementioned roller coaster comes into play. What the hell were Vince McMahon and company thinking with the Dr. Heine skit? which mocked the real-world, life-threatening surgery longtime commentator Jim Ross had undergone just days prior. Was the extremist Muhammad Hassan character really, in any way, shape, or form, a good idea? Was having him and his manager attack a mentally challenged character at WrestleMania honestly the best they could do? This is the roller coaster, Dan Dans. The highs are high and the lows are lows. 2005 was a huge improvement over 2004, though, and for my money, was one of the last great years to be a WWE fan. But it wasn't just inside the ring that WWE was alternating home runs and strikeouts. An overflow on the digital front might be the best way to describe the year for the number one professional wrestling promotion in the world. Day of Reckoning 2, a Nintendo GameCube exclusive, is looked back on very fondly to this day. WrestleMania 21, the Xbox offering, is not. WWE even released a title on the Nokia N-Gage called Aftershock, which was... I mean, it was an N-Gage game. Let's leave it at that. That's three franchises, exclusive to three separate consoles, before we've even reached the topic of today's installment of Triangle X Squared Circle, the wrestling game retrospective series. WWE SmackDown vs. Raw 2006 has been one of the most requested games on this channel for the last three years. I promised I would get to this game down the line, and now... Here we are. This is the seventh installment in the SmackDown franchise, believe it or not. I remember 2005. I don't know about you, but I remember being back in those times wondering what the hell Yukes could cook up to not only have this game stand out amongst the other WWE games on the shelf, but against its older siblings as well. Within seconds of playing, it becomes clear that the gameplay has been completely overhauled. There's a stamina system built into the heads-up display that, if not monitored and managed correctly, can easily cost you a match. Too many high-impact moves in a row will have you out of breath like a heavyweight sweat hog fighting at high altitude. The stamina system isn't the only new mechanic to keep in mind, though. Back in the day, if you wanted to be cheap, you could find a nice rhythm and repeat the same moves over and over until you hit your finisher and call it a day. In SmackDown vs. Raw 2006, that shit is not gonna fly. Repetition will stunt and eventually even reverse the growth of your momentum meter, preventing you from earning that precious, precious finisher. Mixing up your offense between strikes, quick grapples, submissions, and power moves will keep the fans on their feet and your momentum on the rise. These simple improvements, accompanied by a much sharper AI, leads to matches that are way longer than we're used to in the SmackDown series, which, to me, is a welcome change. It's a step out of the arcade realm and into a more simulation-based gameplay style, and I'm a fan of it. And when I say simulation-based, we are not talking about 2K. It's still not that realistic of an approach. It's just a step or two in the right direction. The differences aren't all major, either. We see realism in the shape of the brand new Strong Irish Whip, which allows us to toss our opponent over the top rope with ease. We see realism in the option to hold on to a submission hold even after the opponent has grabbed the rope. For the first time across the entire series, the animation of the referee counting to three has been altered to look much less robotic. Everywhere you look, something has been tweaked and upgraded. No one can accuse Yukes of lacking attention to detail in this one. Season Mode, a tried and true favorite of the SmackDown franchise, returns in a big way. 32 members of the roster are fully voiced throughout the entire campaign. As per usual with a SmackDown title, not all of the voice acting is great. Hey, I saw what Triple H and Flair pulled last week. This crap is getting really old. You okay? 
but it's cool to have it nonetheless. Season mode is split in two parts, one on the Raw side and one on the SmackDown side. Storylines include figuring out who ran over Teddy Long with a car, battling Eddie Guerrero, who was controlling The Undertaker via his fancy urn, battling a faction of former ECW wrestlers who have won and defaced the WWE Championship, heading into a SmackDown vs. Raw war, winning Tori Wilson's contract back from the dastardly JBL, and more. The storytelling is very hokey, but I say that in a good way. The acting is poor, the cutscenes feature motion-captured animations that are some of the worst representations of these moves I've ever seen. It's a fun ride. There is really no point in delaying the inevitable any longer. It's time to talk about GM mode. This is what we're all here for, right? Listen, if you've never experienced it before, let me catch you up to speed. You are in control. Pick Raw, pick SmackDown, it's up to you. Drafting your own roster, in my opinion, is one of the most fun parts of the entire adventure. Whether it's your friend or the AI, you know they're gonna screw you out of several of your top picks, so choosing wisely is of key importance. The red brand has the women's title, and the cruiserweight title is exclusive to the blue show, which makes timely pickups of the Trish Stratuses and Paul Londons of the world an absolute must. There's no free ride though, guys. We start with $10 million, and each superstar we offer a contract to comes with a price. It might seem like a good idea to lock down your main eventers for an entire year, but that costs an ass load of money. Each and every show on the calendar, each and every match we book for that matter, also costs money. If you go around handing out million plus dollar contracts to every former world champion in free agency, you're going to be running advertisements on your weekly TV just to stay afloat and not Paul Heyman this some bitch. Once your roster is set and your inaugural champions are crowned, the madness begins. Establishing rivalries should be your top priority as the general manager of your show. Rivalries in wrestling are where the stories come from, you know? The fans need that back and forth, that one-upsmanship, to really sink their teeth into the product. Building rivalries week by week and keeping them hot for as long as possible leads to better ratings, and better ratings leads to more viewers. More viewers leads to fan changes. You see, the entire point of GM mode is to score more viewers than your competition. We saw it in the 90s when WCW Nitro went head to head with WWF Monday Night Raw. We're seeing it today as AEW Dynamite and NXT are colliding on Wednesdays. There's more to it than just signing talent, managing our funds, and booking the shows, though. What happens when a superstar doesn't like your management style? What happens when they demand a title shot, but you don't give it to them? Get out of right here, man! Shit, I'm saying! They jump ship to the other brand faster than you can say, Screw you! You're fired! That's right. On top of keeping an eye on your wrestlers' contracts and salaries, it's also on you to keep them happy in the performance department. Too many losses or not enough title opportunities will lead to unhappy campers, and that's not a good thing. Elevating their position on the card or offering more money isn't the only solution, though. Let's say this person is a constant pain in the ass and you're just done with them in general. It's possible to offer the opposing general manager a trade which not only ensures the removal of your locker room cancer, but creates new avenues for rivalries and champions on both brands. Let's say you are a great GM. You're the best GM anybody's ever seen. Just keep doing what you're doing, your ratings will get better, and at the end of the year, you will win that General Manager of the Year trophy. But let's say you're not a great GM. Let's say you're getting your ass kicked week to week. That's when shit gets nasty. They say all's fair in love and war, right? I say all's fair in love, war, and GM mode. In desperate times, desperate measures are called for. And that's why I see nothing wrong with sending one of our superstars over to their show to fuck it up. Or maybe we'll just cut a promo on them, trashing their show, putting ourselves over as the number one product on the market. This can lead to popping a great number, or it can completely backfire and lead to better ratings for the very show we were burying. It's a crapshoot, but sometimes it's all we can do. There are several events on the calendar that are interpromotional, meaning both Raw and SmackDown can bring their best to the table in an attempt to come out on top. We've even got Raw vs SmackDown matches, which earn the winning brand a bonus of some sort throughout the year. If you haven't noticed by now, GM mode is deep. 
super deep. There are more balls to juggle here than there are underutilized talents on WWE's roster, which is crazy. The universe modes in today's 2K games pale in comparison, offer nothing but the option to book shows and extend rivalries. There are no show ratings, no viewers to fight for, no contracts to deal with, no trades, no tension. It's just an organizer for standard gameplay. 2K, if you're listening, give us what we want. We want GM mode back. Probably my most requested feature for years and years was just to be able to win and defend championships in exhibition mode. This feature was taken out after SmackDown 2 Know Your Role released in 2000 and has been gone ever since. That is, until now. By the gods they've done it. Championship matches, stat tracking as to who has the belt and how many times they've defended it. This was my dream. Nowadays, in 2020, this doesn't seem like a big deal. But when you'd been deprived of the one feature you'd wanted the most for five years, god damn this was fantastic. I would spend hours and hours creating storylines in my head for my feuds over the championships. Having the full scope of titles encouraged the player to use every character on the roster, too. Of course, you can have The Rock and Bret Hart feud over the world championship, but when it comes to the unlockable million dollar championship, you want to get a little creative. Take a lower level guy like Mark Jindrak and put him against a creative character. How about the United States title? Perfect for exploring the mid-card wrestlers. And it's not only the official WWE Championships we have at our disposal, either, as Create a Championship is back and better than ever. Create a Championship mode made its debut the prior year in the first SmackDown vs. Raw title, and while it was a welcome addition to the series, it was far from ideal. The belts were way too expensive, and you could only defend them in Create a Pay-Per-View mode. It was a step in the right direction, sure, but there was definitely room for improvement, and that's where SmackDown vs. Raw 2006 comes in. The customization options have grown exponentially. The cost of creating a belt is much more reasonable, allowing us to create as many titles as our imagination can cook up. We can defend said titles in exhibition mode, and holy shit we can even engrave our own nameplates. Did I mention that the mode isn't exclusive to singles titles? Go ahead, make a brand new set of tag team championships, do whatever you want. This is the kind of freedom you look for in a wrestling game, and this is exactly the kind of year over year improvement you like to see from an annual franchise. The SmackDown franchise always excelled in the match types department, didn't it? Table matches, ladder matches, steel cage matches, hell in a cell matches, elimination chamber matches. We were fairly spoiled over the years. But it was never enough, and Ukes listened to us, to their credit. Making their SmackDown debuts in this installment are two match types from polar opposite ends of the spectrum. First up, we've got Fulfill Your Fantasy, where two divas are pitted against each other in a ring complete with a bed and pillows. We can't forget the most important part of the operation, though, which is deciding which outfit we're gonna wear. If nurses, schoolgirls, and French maids are your thing, let me tell you something, Mean Jean. You're gonna have a great time. The first diva to fill their fantasy meter through spankings and the removal of their opponent's clothing is declared the winner. How many of you had parents walk in during one of these matches and you scrambled to explain what the hell was going on? Up next, we've got the most dangerous match in the industry. The type of match you only sign up for if you're willing to risk your life for the mere chance to extinguish the existence of your most bitter rival. I'm talking, of course, about the Buried, buried alive, alive Match. match. <laughs> the first Buried Alive Match took place in 1996, and its first video game appearance is SmackDown vs. Raw 2006. How or why it took that long to figure out how to make this happen, I don't know. But it's finally here. A Buried Alive Match only ends where one of the involved competitors is, well, buried alive. You throw them into the grave and cover them in dirt, head to toe. They disappear under the earth and are dead and gone. It's not rocket science. So why, oh why, is that not how it works in the game? Instead of an open grave, we've got a casket that is above ground. It's not even recessed into the dirt to make it level with the grave. It's straight up just sitting on top of the grass. But that's okay, right? Obviously, we'll throw our opponent into the casket, it'll lower down into the grave, and then they'll be buried, right? Wrong. And that's the last place you want to be in a buried alive match. And that's it. It's over. And that's it. Not only does the casket not lower, 
But the dirt doesn't even cover the fucking casket. That's not even enough dirt to keep the loser from being able to just push the fucking lid open. I don't mean to complain, but honestly, the match has been around for 10 years at this point. How did they mess it up so badly? I could say I'm surprised, but this is the same team that attached the Hell in a Cell cage to the ring for two straight games, which has never been used in the entire history of WWE. Unreal. While we're on the topic of disappointments, let's talk about the other weird parts of SVR 06. These aren't the end of the world, they're really not big deals at all, but they're always things that have stood out to me over the years, so I figure they're worth talking about. Earlier I put over the fact that we can finally book titles in exhibition mode, but I didn't mention that every single championship match ends with a grand celebration and mass amounts of confetti. Seriously, every single title match. I understand a huge deal being made about Shawn Michaels coming out of retirement and winning the championship inside the Elimination Chamber, but Orlando Jordan picking up a hardcore title victory over Heidenreich gets the confetti treatment? Really? It's a bit much. Speaking of titles, look at the size of these fucking things. Several of the belts are way, way too big, like comically oversized. And on the topic of things being the wrong size, can anyone explain to me why Rob Van Dam Christian, Ric Flair, and Shawn Michaels are all considered cruiserweights in this game? What the hell is that about? This last one isn't a mistake or anything, it's just a cool thing to look back on. Jake the Snake Roberts is a member of the roster, but the only way to play as him is to link your PSP to your PlayStation 2 and transfer the data from one to the other. What a pain in the ass. Just because I took a second to talk about some of the weird parts of this game doesn't mean I've run out of things to gush about, because I haven't. SVR 06 is absolutely worth all the praise I've heaped on it so far, and then some. I haven't even gone into the fact that, for the first time in any WWE game, we've got an official representation of the ECW arena, which is fucking awesome. One Night Stand was an incredible event for longtime ECW fans, as well as newcomers to the brand. Having the opportunity to walk down that aisle and break tables inside the ECW ring, forget about it. On the WWE side of things, how about the WrestleMania 9 arena, right? We're outdoors, the sun is shining, the retro colored ropes are large and in charge. This is too sweet. One thing that maybe isn't too sweet for whoever's responsible for the mess is that we don't just have wrestlers bleeding in this game. The blood actually trickles off their head and stains the mat. And we're not talking about a few drips either. These guys fill the ring with puddles of blood that looks like something out of The Shining. Goodness me. The abundance of legends in the series has only grown from its inception in Here Comes the Pain, and that's a good thing. We've got the British Bulldog, Bret Hart, Mankind, Junkyard Dog, and more. But what's really interesting is the three different versions of Hulk Hogan. 80s Hogan, NWO Hogan, and the red and yellow modern version all have their own slots on the roster. Is that overkill? Maybe. But is it cool? Yeah, I think so. Overall, SBR 06's roster is larger than its predecessors and comes packed with the debuts of 20 unique superstars. The Basham Brothers, Chris Masters, Eugene, Orlando Jordan, Robert Conway, Snitsky, Paul London, and several others are all appearing for the first time, which is pretty cool. I don't look back on the totality of this roster all that fondly these days, but there are bright spots. Variations don't only show themselves in the form of different outfits and arenas though, no sir. And what is yet another first for the SmackDown franchise, we've got a choice when it comes to the finish of our steel cage matches. We've always been able to get over the top to safety when it comes to securing a win, but now we can exit through the door as well. Climbing over the top has been tweaked turning the escape attempts into a minigame. These cage escape minigames, especially when you're playing against a friend, are the best kind of insane. But we've got more choices to make outside of how we want to win the cage match. How about, what kind of cage match do we want to have? In 2006, Shawn Michaels taking on Edge in a cage seems natural, right? The hot feud, the bright lights, the chain link fence. But it wasn't always this way. Back in the day, the cage wasn't chain link at all. It was referred to as Big Blue, and it was incredibly unforgiving. Big Blue's inclusion in SVR 06 was something I never knew I wanted. But once it was made available, I don't think I ever went back to the current day chain link. What an excellent move by Ukes to toss this in the game. They didn't have to, and they did. Let's go on the extra mile, Dan Dans. Going the extra mile seems to be a common theme with this game, doesn't it? 
extra legends, new match types, several different cages, new animations across the board. Yuke's really went all out to make sure that this game was overflowing with content. But there's one highly customizable feature that we haven't touched on at all yet, which is the locker room. And you might be asking yourself, Who gives a shit about a fucking locker room? What am I gonna do with a locker room? I'm not here to get dressed. I'm here to wrestle. I'm here to win the title. I'm here to break necks. In season mode, and even from the main menu, we can access the locker room. You see these floors? Totally customizable. The walls? Boom. The table? Come on. Every corner in this room is open to display an item of your choosing. Ah, uh, you don't. We can unlock and show off collectibles on our desk and entertainment center. We've got a trophy case for all of our accomplishments, and right next to it, a shadow box full of championship belts. Pretty fucking cool, right? But wait! There's more! If you're a stats junkie like me, you'll love the record book on the computer desk. This keeps track of every single match we've ever played. It tells us our longest and shortest matches. It keeps a win-loss record against every opponent in the game. These little details are out of control, and I absolutely love this level of personal flavor we can add to our game. We can customize everything, all the way down to the loading screens. You'll notice which ones I do and don't have turned on. Get the fuck out of here. How you doing? How you doing? I don't know who asked for this, but holy shit, this is really cool. SmackDown vs. Raw 2006 went for it, and it went hard. When its predecessor, the original SVR, followed the legendary SmackDown Here Comes the Pain, some fans were left underwhelmed. SVR is a good game, but after the seismic leap that was Here Comes the Pain, it left a bit to be desired. SVR 06 took that advice to heart and hit the ring guns blazing. The added match types, the brand new game modes, updated gameplay, larger roster, new legends, gorgeous graphics, and newly super cinematic season mode made a difference. This is the sequel SmackDown fans had truly been clamoring for. The reviews spoke volumes about the love that went into this new installment, and the sales figures don't lie. SVR 06 released in November of 2005, and inside of just one year, had moved 3.3 million units at retail. The series that began in 2000 on the Sony PlayStation had come a long, long way, and throughout its entire history, PlayStation loyalists touted SmackDown as their game. This one was ours. The N64 kids had no mercy, but damn it, SmackDown belonged to us. SmackDown vs. Raw 2006, though released on PlayStation 2 and the Sony PSP, would indeed be the final installment of the franchise exclusive to PlayStation consoles. It was a hell of a run and an amazing way to send the franchise off into the world. I will never forget playing WCW Thunder while my friends tore into their copies of Revenge on N64, damn it. So since its inception, SmackDown had always been home for me. As a tried and true PlayStation gamer, I tip my cap to the series that was always there. There you have it, Dan Dans. That's my retrospective on WWE SmackDown vs. Raw 2006. Now, I promised a huge announcement coming into this episode, and now is the time to make that announcement. The video that you just watched was the season finale of Triangle X Squared Circle. It's time to put this show on the shelf, and for good reason. I'm now going to focus most of my creative time and energy on the next huge 616 Entertainment project. As you guys know, June 16th, that 616 is a very important day around here. That's our WrestleMania, it's our E3, it's our Super Bowl. It's the biggest day of the year. I am extremely proud to announce that the history of Resident Evil will premiere on 616 2020. I've been quietly working on it for a little while now and I am so excited for you guys to see part one. There are more major announcements coming on 616 2020 that you don't want to miss including a new show that may or may not be very interesting to you hardcore wrestling fans, so I hope you guys stick around. I want to say thank you to everybody who's taken this wild Triangle X Squared Circle journey with me and reliving all these fucking memories. It's been a blast, and we're going to keep having a blast through the history of Resident Evil and eventually when Triangle X Squared Circle comes back. You know, someday maybe the Patreon will be big enough that I can do this for a living and I can work on three, four, five big fucking shows at the same time. But as it stands, we're not there yet. Maybe someday, though. But there are only bigger and better things to come. As always, I love you guys. I hope everybody's safe. I hope everybody's happy. I hope everybody's healthy. And I will see you next time.
I'm here to win the title. I'm here to break necks. <laughs> what the fuck am I doing? This is terrible. Table matches, ladder matches, cage matches. Uh, what do you think? Huh? What do you think? You look tired. You tired? Probably my most request... What, I blinked weird there, I think, right? <laughs> the fuck? to look presentable. My most requested feature for... <sighs> Probably my most requested feature for years and years was the simple... Ability 